Uh, I'm Greg Lowe. I am the, uh, the Group Chief Executive at Becker, and I'm also the, uh, the co-chair for New Zealand for the Australia New Zealand Leadership Forum, um, the ANZLF. And so I'd like to welcome my, uh, my fellow panellists here today, um, Professor Natasha Hamilton-Hart, Niels Meinderts and uh, Adrian Collier, who I'm going to introduce to you shortly. And, uh, and we're delighted to have this opportunity to, um, to talk about uh, the topic of business aspirations for closer economic relations between Australia and New Zealand and our wider region. And this is a subject that's, um, that's very close to my heart. Um, the ANZLF has been looking forward to marking the 40th anniversary this year of the CER agreement. We, um, uh, we were unable to have our physical forums um, uh, in the last few years, but did have a very successful forum in Sydney last year, and, um, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade were very keen to have another forum this year to celebrate 40 years of CER. Um, it's also the 80-year um, anniversary for diplomatic relations between Australia and New Zealand. Um, and so that forum will be in Wellington in mid-July, and that coincides um, with the, uh, um, uh, TPCC, the TTCPP Trade Ministers meeting and also the, minister, the, um, the annual leaders meeting between our two Prime Ministers. So we're looking forward for a, um, a good turnout and a good discussion around clo closer economic relations. Um, if you don't know much about the ANZLF, it's a mechanism that brings business and government together to help both countries prosper. Its primary focus is around business activity, the closer economic relations and the single economic market. And this enables us to communicate key priorities of business to both governments and discuss potential solutions. And there's a very active officials group that works in the single economic market forum um, between MFAT and DFAT looking to, um, to resolve barriers to successful trade between Australia and New Zealand. Um, there's no doubt that back in the 1980s, CER contributed to the opening up of the New Zealand economy, um, as was discussed yesterday by Hamish McDougall in the opening session. And in subsequent decades, it has underpinned the strong growth in two-way trade between Australia and New Zealand and gave New Zealand the confidence to tackle other export markets. It's our oldest and first free trade agreement. But of course, what matters more um, to business leaders uh, rather than where we've come from is where we're going to next. And so we want to use this year of, a, uh, of the anniversary of a CER to look to see where we can refresh and modernise the CER trade agreement in areas um, uh, like the digital economy to facilitate the frictionless movement of capital, people, goods, services and data. Um, between our two countries so the single economic market opportunity can be more fully realised. And the ANZLF sees a number of opportunities to advance CER and some of these are in the areas like the digital economy, um, climate change and sustainability, indigenous business collaboration um, and the single economic market agenda which includes travel and tourism, labour and skills shortages and infrastructure planning, and there's quite a lot of discussion even in the last week between our two countries about, um, about how we might respond um, together to some of the challenges from the extreme weather events we've seen in the last couple of weeks. I've got a lot to say on these topics, but you haven't come here to hear me, and, and we're all keen to hear what our panellists have to say about this. And so I'd like to invite each of our panellists to speak for up to 10 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A um, session. And so we'll start with a bilateral focus and move through to a regional focus and, and, um, and I'll start by asking Adrian Collier to come in and, and talk to you. Adrian is the Chief Product and Supply Chain Officer at Trade Window. He's had a wide-ranging career in the private sector as well as being the New Zealand Trade Commissioner in Taiwan for several years and he's also a fine example of education at the University of Auckland. Um, Adrian took part in last year's ANZLF discussion on business aspirations for the digital economy in relation to cross-border trade, and this is something which remains high on our ANZLF agenda. So please welcome Adrian. Atihei Māori ora, ina mana, ina reo, ina rangatirama. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. 
Good afternoon and thank you, Greg, for that very kind introduction and for the opportunity to share a few thoughts today about the mix of technology and trade uh, in the context of the Australian-New Zealand trade relationship and where it could go next. As Greg mentioned, I work for a company called Trade Window. Uh, we're a trade tech company. It means we make software and we sell it to people involved in international trade. We're a team of about 100 people, uh, a really diverse team, lots of different cultures, lots of languages spoken at work, and we are truly a mix of the geeky at one end and the not so geeky at the other end. And I'll let you guys try and figure out which bucket I fall into. What connects us, however, is that we know trade, we know software, and we love solving problems. We're focused on simplifying the arcane, complex, and sometimes baffling processes of global trade. We work with around 450 importers, exporters, freight forwarders on both sides of the Tasman, a few countries in Asia, and more recently in America. In preparing for this session today, I was able to spend some time with the Honourable Tim Grosser. Uh, he was one of the original architects of CER uh, through the late 70s into the mid 80s. And he was very generous with his time and he certainly had some very interesting stories to tell. It was a, it was a fascinating discussion, and it's especially for me, given that I studied some of these things at this university at what uh, seems like 100 years ago right now. Tim painted for me a picture of Fortress NZ, one of the last countries in the world to have importing licences of state control down to the level that controlled the number of kilometres freight could travel on a truck before it had to be handed over to a train, so as to protect the state-owned railways. By today's standards, this is some truly bizarre stuff. Tim described two key forces that allowed CER to flourish. The reforms of frontier protection, uh, the dismantling of that protectionist infrastructure, and the domestic economic reform put in place by the 1984 Labour government. Both of these things underpinned by a core idea of being bold and decisive. It was the combination of changes to the external trade framework and the domestic changes that brought about one of, if not, the most important trade agreement in New Zealand's history. All this in the face of staunch opposition from the political and business elites up and down the country and a general belief that CER would just never happen. So you fast forward 40 years and there are some interesting parallels. Inflation is on the rise. Globally, protectionism is rearing its head, and even the spectre of stagflation is stalking our economy. And once again, we should aim to be bold and decisive, both at the frontier, through our international agreements, and domestically via legislation. This time with a focus on using technology to drive efficiency and economic advantage. Just to be clear, technology is not the issue here. All the foundational technologies are in place and available. It's how we use the technology that really matters today. So from an external or frontier perspective, I'm excited that the Australian New Zealand Leadership Forum proposed that Australia and New Zealand negotiate a trans-Tasman digital economy agreement. This could easily become part of CER over time. As they said in their announcement, and I quote, this would round out the single economic market to encompass the governance and enablement of the digital economy help to future-proof a more seamless trans-Tasman regulatory environment and equip the bilateral trade and economic relationship to more fully reflect 21st century business models. So with this in mind, we've watched closely and welcomed the provisions for digital trade in some of our trade agreements, CPTPP, RCEP, ANSFIDA, the UK agreement, and of course, DEPA agreement between New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile. These agreements are, however, strong on the why and what of digital trade, but not so much on the how. Trade Window would advocate that the government require mandatory, or at least with good review and meaningful periods, that paperless trade options exist in all of our existing and new trade agreements. This would have the dual advantage of allowing the benefits of digital trade to flow through to exporters and would help the domestic bureaucracy gear up and comply with those obligations. So that's from an external perspective, really making sure that we can bake digital trade in to our important international agreements. From a domestic perspective, 
we believe a more supportive regulatory framework could be something truly transformational for importers and exporters. And we shouldn't underestimate the impact also that digital trade will have on making our economy and trade more sustainable and more resilient. The United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, which is a subsidiary body of the UN General Assembly, monitors the adoption of 22 conventions and model laws by member states. The United States of America leads the charge. They have adopted or signed 16 out of 22. New Zealand has adopted or signed five. 91 states are ahead of us and have adopted more conventions or model laws than New Zealand. There are three particular model laws that focus on digital trade. Three states have adopted all three. 35 states have adopted two. 48 states, including New Zealand, have adopted one. And 111 states haven't done anything. On the basis that paperless trade can be a source of value to New Zealand exporters and the economy overall, New Zealand should aim to join the group of higher performing nations rather than being content to loiter at the middle of the pack. The adoption of model law for electronic signatures and electronic transferable documents needs to move to the top of the legislative agenda. Engaging the imaginations of politicians, public servants and business community is just as important as any technology or legal frameworks. And for this reason, we'd recommend characterising uh, the, these action plans as an Australia-New Zealand digital trade corridor. And there should be no reason why it can't be the best, most productive, most efficient trade corridor in the world. An agreement would hopefully be coupled with some ambition. Just as an example, maybe 40% of ANZ trade, digital trade, by the end of 2025. We would suggest an agreement would require adoption with timelines of regulations to incentivise digital trade, particularly for parties who have been reluctant to be involved because of siloed or self-interested reasons. These regulations would need to incentivise all stakeholders to do their part, including sea and air freight carriers, insurance companies, banks, freight forwarders, customs brokers and the like. The push to a digital trade corridor needs to be accompanied by government assistance for small and medium organisations to adopt paperless trade processes. Inclusivity is huge, and it's vital to ensure that there are on-ramps for SMEs of all types. So summing up, the integrated economy that we have today between Australia and New Zealand is the long-term result of bold thinking in the 80s. Tim Grosser told me, that it was widely accepted in the international trading community at the time that the original CER was the gold standard of bilateral FTAs and a great deal of influence on other trade agreements around the world in the 80s and 90s. So that same organising principle of the original CER agreement to be bold and decisive should, in my view, be exactly the organising principle behind designing a digital trade corridor for trans-Tasman trade today. Given the nature of our two economies, 40 years of cooperation on trade and significant success to build on, we're ready to take this collaboration to the next level. We need to draw on those lessons of the past and aim to establish nothing less than an international gold standard ANZ digital trade corridor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Uh, and as you know, the ANZLF is very keen on the idea of a trade corridor and a trade agreement, a digital trade agreement um, with Australia. I did um, have the opportunity to raise this with our new Prime Minister um, uh, uh, during his um, recent trip to Canberra and our discussion with Australian um, business. And, uh, and it, I would, it would be fair to say um, uh, that we are finding some, uh, he's quite enthusiastic, but we're finding some, enthu uh, some resistance at a bureaucratic level to um, have that discussion. It was interesting to hear your commentary on, uh, on uptake 
Globally, um, New Zealand does have digital trade agreements with other countries. It does have, and so does Australia. We don't, we don't have with each other. Um, and, and given our enthusiasm and our general uptake for all things digital, it is kind of baffling why um, why we can't make better progress in the um, in the digital trade front. And I'm sure that's um, that's an everyday reality for you. Um, I, I thought your comments also about the environment in which CER was established were. Um, were very insightful and a great reminder to us that the things that we take for granted today weren't always that way. And of course, 40 years ago, um, free trade agreements and the WTO were in their infancy. Um, and, uh, and so to establish an agreement that was um, so far reaching for both countries was quite an achievement. And I think that you're right to, um, um, to highlight that. So thank you um, uh, uh, for those comments. And I'd now like to introduce uh, Niels Meindertz. Uh, who is the Regulatory Affair Manage Affairs Manager for Air New Zealand. Um, Niels leads Air New Zealand's global engagement with government agencies and regulators on key strategic issues. He was formerly with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade with a focus on global policy and law and has also worked in the commercial law sector. So please welcome Niels. Kia ora koutou. Uh, thanks, Greg, for the introduction. Um, I'm not going to be as polished as uh, Adrian. I, I have the excuse that um, I've just come back from parental leave uh, and have had about four hours sleep. So, um, but I, have, so I feel very passionate about, the C, about CER. And I'd like to just, before I talk about business aspirations, um, put out there that um, there is some some reparation that needs to be done post-COVID within the context of CER. You know, we, we turned our backs on the single economic market there for a, for a couple of years. And um, I don't think businesses really look at it as a single economic market right now. You know, if you had your distribution warehouse in Sydney uh, and you were looking to get your goods and your people to New Zealand um, for those two years, you would be facing some serious challenges. Um, so, you know, if you're planning for the future, you will not be looking at Australia and New Zealand as a single economic market. So um, I challenge officials here in the room as well to um, use the 40th anniversary to come back together and to be more aspirational and to make sure that we don't turn our backs on each other again. You know, the EU, uh, again, another single economic market um, holds the freedom of movement of people as, you know, sacrosanct. And they also, you know, um, made some mistakes, but they repaired those mistakes pretty quickly. So, um, yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Um, so in terms of aspirations, um, in New Zealand, uh, within the context of CER, have three, three key goals, really. Uh, and that's seamless travel. Uh, secondly, reducing the taxes and levies that um, we you know, experience in terms of trans-Tasman travel. And thirdly, the importance of decarbonisation. And if we want to grow the single economic market, getting serious about decarbonisation of, of aviation, of maritime, is absolutely critical. So firstly, um, seamless travel. So I don't know if anyone's travelled across the Tasman recently, but it's far from seamless right now. And um, we did, during COVID again, introduce further complications, such as the NZTD, the New Zealand Traveller Declaration, which actually I, I believe in. It is there as something that can improve travel and um, can help governments deal with some of the risks in trans-Tasman travel. Um, and so when it gets reintroduced later this year, uh, I'd like to see it being used as an opportunity to, um, to improve uh, the cross-border movement there. So, you know, for, for agencies such as MPI to, to look at uh, using the information that's shared during the NZTD process to um, manage the risks effectively before people get to the airport. So that, you know, if, if we can have a travel pass for APEC, we could have a travel pass for CER, you know? It's a much uh, smaller 
um, bilateral and trusted bilateral relationship where I think those, those risks can be balanced. Um, taxes and levies. Um, so there are more taxes and levies on a trans-Tasman journey um, than there are on a US uh, New Zealand journey. So taking the Auckland Sydney uh, versus Auckland Los Angeles um, uh, example, Auckland Sydney, a fifth of the distance, but more taxes. So there are $316 worth of taxes and levies on a Trans Tasman journey. That is quite a chunk. And if freedom of movement and, and of people that is absolutely critical to a single economic market is taken seriously, then uh, we need to, to, to look at that. Um, and so, um, you know, that's not all, all government um, taxes and levies. Um, Sydney Airport themselves um, charge $116 for um, per ticket, basically, per landing. So that's a big chunk of it. And it is important that border agencies are properly funded and properly resourced to be able to do the great job that they do. Phil. <laughs> um, so thirdly, um, decarbonisation. Um, we cannot grow the single economic market without taking uh, decarbonisation seriously in aviation, spe especially. So um, international aviation emissions aren't covered by the Paris Agreement right now. And so, um, uh, you know, officials, when they show up to Paris Agreement negotiations, they aren't held accountable right now for New Zealand's international aviation emissions. So um, my experience is that officials are very much focused right now on land transport and dealing with the emissions that come from, from that. And aviation is seen as something that can be dealt with you know, when it actually comes, when it's actually measured, when it actually comes um, under the auspices of the Paris Agreement. But that day will come. And if we don't act on this now, then, uh, you know, we will be a lot less competitive as a, a country, a, a, a trade-focused country in the future. So there are uh, several um, solutions here. Sustainable aviation fuel probably for the Trans-Tasman is the best solution. So taking a, a trans-Tasman approach, a regional approach to that moving forward, um, and, 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 and looking at possible domestic production of that, uh, which is possible both in Australia and New Zealand, um, could be a, a solution there. So, so I'll, I'll leave you with those three points, um, and happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Niels, and, and congratulations uh, to Air New Zealand on the, um, the position that they're taking around decarbonisation of aviation. I know there's quite a lot of work going on um, around electrically powered small turboprop, um, uh, well, probably not, sorry, but electrically powered small propeller driven aircraft. Um, and uh, and, and um, I know Greg Foran is particularly enthusiastic about sustainable aviation fuel and talks a lot about that. Um, uh, I see that there are steps afoot to, um, to establish a um, production terminal in Queensland um, and I agree with you, there's no reason why we can't be developing sustainable aviation fuel production here um, in New Zealand. We've certainly got the, um, uh, the industry backdrop to be able to, um, um, to do that from a, um, from a range of sources and it's, um, it's interesting to see how quickly this is developing um, internationally, um, certainly in markets like the US uh, and, um, and the aviation industry is, is um, moving quickly in the decarbonisation um, discussion. Discussion. Seamless travel is, uh, is, um, is really important between our two countries uh, and there was quite a lot of, um, of discussion between airports and airlines and regulatory officials during the pandemic um, around the idea of the Trans-Tasman bubble um, and that certainly got some good conversation going on. Pre-pandemic we had some good trials going on around Trusted Traveller and I know there's work going on in the area of, um, of sharing scan bag information to try and make the experience a better experience. And so I think a little bit of um, outside the box thinking uh, and um, in terms of how that experience um, at, a, at a micro level can be improved as, as part of that discussion and I know that there are there's a lot of enthusiasm it's not 
all that easy in Australia with state and federal complications, but certainly not um, something that can't be overcome. And your, your comparison with the APEC travel card, I think, is, um, is a really good one. So I'd like now to introduce uh, Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart, who is the director of the New Zealand Asia Institute here at the University of Auckland. Natasha's research interests encompass business and government in Southeast Asia, including foreign investment flows, financial regulation, and the natural resources sector. And she has an interest in regional, regional cooperation in Asia. So taking us to a slightly uh, more regional perspective, please welcome Natasha. Thank you very much, Greg, for that introduction. And my thanks also to the P Public Policy Institute and Jennifer Curtin and her team for organising this terrific event. Um, we're well into the second day, and I have taken on board so much from the previous panellists, I was starting to think there wouldn't be that much to say in my own presentation. Um, what I will do is address some of the business challenges uh, for New Zealand companies that they, as they face as they look out going into the Asian region, the sort of broad East Asian, Indonesia to Japan uh, region. And um, I should preface this by saying, of course, when I talk about business aspirations, I do not speak for any business or business sector. I'm a professor. This is, uh, my remarks are based on the research that I've done at the New Zealand Asia Institute for about the last five years, and that also research conducted by my colleagues, particularly Ben Fath and Ancha Fiedler. Um, so the context that has been the focus of this uh, last two days around the evolving trade architecture, the, cha um, the nature of the changing nature of trade at the regional and global level, is very much the, the background for these remarks. Um, that landscape is evolving. Um, there have been a couple of other issues, obviously, that have of enormous concern in the last couple of years, particularly around logistics, the disruptions to travel, the disruptions to transport that my fellow panelists have just mentioned. Um, these are areas where we, we hope um, the worst is behind us um, until the next one, I guess. Um, but there are some ongoing issues that New Zealand companies face. And these are the ones that I want to touch on now. Um, and there are two challenges in particular that I want to focus on. One is around firm capability, and the other is around the regional non-market environment. Uh, so firm capability, I mean, this could be sort of summed up by saying size matters. Um, it is a critical issue for a company, you know, how large it is. Um, and if you want to realise economies of scale, if you want to be able to invest in a substantial on-the-ground presence in the market that you're trying to engage with, if you want to be able to scale up production in response to customer demand, uh, or even if you want to be able to absorb meaningfully new information about the market opportunities and the regulatory environment that you face, size matters for all of these things. And we're very familiar with our flagship firms, uh, Air New Zealand, Zespri, Fonterra, uh, Becker, uh, Gallagher's. Uh, these are companies that are very substantial. They have not just a big presence in New Zealand, but they have a, a really good international network, and they have the ability to do all of these things. But as others have remarked, that's not your typical New Zealand company. It's not even your typical New Zealand exporting company. So in my research, I've talked to many companies where they might have you know, 10 people on the payroll. Uh, and for those people, just simply uh, running the business uh, is, is a full-time occupation and that they don't have the slack to be based in multiple countries. They can't devote a staff member to government relations uh, because that staff member is also needed for other things. So the, the domestic firm capability issue is a real one for New Zealand. If we do actually want to grow our exporting profile, and I note that although we like to pack our, pat ourselves on the back, in fact, our exports as a percentage of GDP have not increased. In fact, they have slightly decreased over the years. Uh, so we could definitely do better, and we need to do better if we want to be able to deliver rising living standards um, and more inclusive growth models, which require redistribution. But as a previous panelist said, if you're going to redistribute, you have to have something to redistribute. 
Uh, a lot of that, obviously, is not a trade issue. Building firm capability is a domestic policy issue, and it touches on our own uh, tax, labor market, regulatory policies, industrial policy, if you're feeling adventurous, uh, and largely not trade. Um, however, it does sort of feature in that trade may be a route to company growth, and so the more we can enhance international engagement, that may also be a way of getting to, to a certain critical mass size. So let me turn to the other um, challenge, which is around the regional country's non-market envi environment. The, the, and, and by non-market environment, I mean the political and regulatory and cultural landscape of a country where you might want to do business. Um, I think our firms generally have a pretty good hold on the market environment. They do their consumer research, they survey their customers, they look at market trends, and, and, and generally do that incredibly well. But the non-market environment is much, much harder because it includes things not just the, the very complex and evolving and, um, and difficult to understand substance of law and regulation in each country, uh, and we're a long way from harmonization, but as well as the, the actual letter of the law or the letter of the regulations, there is the entire institutional infrastructure that determines how those laws and regulations are actually interpreted and applied. And here is where you can get a lot of slippage between what appears to be written down and what actually happens. And that is something that New Zealand companies that are going to engage in any depth in, a, in, a, in an offshore market um, frequently come up against, not just that the regulations are changing, and that could be you know, whether it's regulations affecting their, their labor market policies, uh, labor conditions, requirements to meet the law in that sense, or whether it's tax, or whether it's product safety or other things. These things are subject to change, but they're also often not very clear what they are in the first place. And then you have to grapple with how an official on the ground is going to actually implement them. Whether it is, you know, you might have a, a legal right uh, that exists on paper, but you would be completely wasting your time and worse if you tried to pursue that right through the local court system. Um, so these, these sorts of compliance costs, or, but they're not just compliance with formal regulations, these are critical issues for our companies as they go offshore. Um, and they suffer from being in a peripheral position uh, in host country business systems and networks. Because for most of our companies, they, because they're small, they work at a distance, they're often dealing through distributors and agents, and so they are very, very far from the dense interfirm networks of that exchange information uh, within which companies have a reason to care about their reputation and to support each other in many ways. But if you stand on the outside of those networks, you're a long way from being um, integrally integrated and you, you are at an information deficit, but you're also at a strategic deficit. So those are some critical issues that our fir firms face in the market. What does that mean for trade policy makers? And let me just offer a couple of remarks. Um, Domestic capacity building is obviously um, not the primary uh, role of trade policy makers, but of course our NZ Inc. infrastructure matters, and this is very fragmented, and it's something that obviously could be more strategic. Um, the second issue is, of course, market access still matters. Um, you know, if you can get access to the market on paper is, of course, an, a critically important determinant. Um, but compliance is, in, is, is really around in the detail, and I've watched with interest the evolution of MFAT's case against the Indonesian government and the WTO over beef over the years, because I also look at this as someone who studies Indonesian business and political economy. And while NFAT was pursuing and succeeding uh, in its cases against Indonesia in the WTO, there was a whole discourse unfolding in Indonesia around food sovereignty and food security that paid absolutely no attention at all to the WTO case or to any of Indonesia's international trade commitments. They were completely irrelevant. So the deeply rooted domestic aspirations for food self-sufficiency and food sovereignty and food security, and in Indonesia they're all bundled up together, um, they're not going away. So even though on appeal uh, New Zealand has won again, um, what we can see is that the Indonesian government is responding with an even more dense and complicated raft of regulatory requirements. 
Um, so how do trade policy makers um, get any cut through in this environment in order to be able to support our companies to grow in these, in, in these places? And I think we do get to a point where you reach the limits of trade negotiations. And as the previous panelists said, um, there's an awful lot that you need to do in terms of understanding the other side and where they are coming for. Because behind every NTB or non-tariff barrier, there is a domestic coalition of interests, people who believe in that barrier as something quite legitimate. Now, whether that's for nakedly protectionist reasons or whether it's because they actually have values invested in that, that will vary. But in a sense, it doesn't matter. You need to understand who those players are, what is important to them as their bottom line, who your potential allies are on the ground in those countries, and who are the people that you might actually be able to work with in order to develop a bit of your own coalition on the ground in that country. Because hammering away at the trade negotiations uh, door is not the way I think you will achieve lasting change, unless there is, of course, a domestic coalition of interest in favor of those changes. Um, so sometimes you'll get lucky uh, and you'll ride a liberalizing domestic wave in a particular market, uh, but at other times the, the nationalism or what we perceive as uh, an annoying regulatory environment that is keeping us out and preventing us from being efficient, that is going to be a feature of the regional environment. And I think our trade officials and our trade policy makers can try and work with that, uh, but it's probably a, a somewhat different mindset. Um, so just finally, there's a lot of help that um, hack can only be given on a G2G basis. And I want to, I believe um, Phil from MPI is gone, but one of the examples I use with my students is just how useful the MPI agency to agency relationships are in China, where a company that we did a case study on, uh, Zephyr Cider, um, in their very early days, they went off to China. Their consignment of cider, which was fully documented and perfectly compliant, got held up at the border by an official who said, what is cider? This is fake wine. Um, and it was, they, they, I mean, they really faced losing their entire consignment. They couldn't get through to their suppliers in Shanghai, uh, that, sorry, their customers in Shanghai who needed it. Um, and he was able to get on the phone to MPI, get someone from MPI to talk to their Chinese counterparts in a way that was credible and convincing enough to get their cider through the port. Now, that can only happen if the regulators have really close working relationships with each other. And that is, I think, where there's a lot of mileage that we can still build on uh, and, and deliver more value. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Natasha. Um, uh, I, I thought your commentary around size matters was really interesting um, because, of course, larger organisations do have uh, deeper capability to deal with some of those, um, some of those bureaucratic um, barriers. Uh, and for small business, there is a lot of challenge uh, in market, and, of course, all of those markets across um, Southeast Asia and North Asia are quite different. Um, my own business um, uh, invested in the Mekong region um, about 10 years ago, in addition to our, our investments in Singapore and Myanmar Myanmar and, and, and Indonesia, um, uh, in the hope that we would see an ASEAN economic community, um, which uh, really had the had the aspiration for the free movement of capital and trade and goods and, and people um, across that region, as it was 300 years ago. Um, that's that was you know certainly the rhetoric at the time, and that hasn't transpired. Um, and so uh, so often um, uh, often the hidden barriers, the non-tariff barriers, are the are the ones that are difficult to um, um, to overcome and even find. And um, and I know that uh, in the next panel you're going to be hearing from Vangelis Fatalis, who has been at the forefront of. Um, uh, of, uh, of including services in free trade agreements and looking for ways through non-tariff barriers. So um, I think it's great that um, MFAT and Trade and Enterprise are very focused on those, um, those issues. Okay, well, we've, we've talked about um, uh, business aspirations uh, for CER and the wider region. Uh, and uh, the ANZLF is, um, is also interested in what Australia and New Zealand can do 
together um, around engagement with business in the South Pacific region to contribute to, prosper to um, prosperity and stability in the region. And we had an excellent conversation in Sydney at a leadership forum last May um, around what both countries are doing in the Pacific um, individually and actually if both countries work together collectively in the Pacific um, we might do some more, um, we might make some more progress, um, particularly around establishing enduring economic activity that creates jobs, creates income. And, and deepens our influence in that region for both a, an economic and stability viewpoint. Um, and uh, and Glynis Miller in the previous panel uh, commented on some of those opportunities. And so I just I would be interested in um, in in, in uh, the thoughts of any of our panelists around. Um, uh, uh, what the New Zealand business community, or how the New Zealand business community might add value um, in the South Pacific to enhance um, prosperity. I had dinner on Tuesday night with the Defence Secretaries of Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific region, and we had a good discussion around industry and defence um, in that region. But I'd be interested to, to, um, to just talk a little bit about do we see opportunity for New Zealand to add value in the South Pacific and enhance that prosperity? So. Um, uh, Adrian, Niels, you might like to make comment on that. <laughs> Thanks very much. I, th I think, generally speaking, it's about trying to you know, lower compliance cost and just increase access. Uh, and if I think about digital trade, you know, that's kind of the hat that I'm wearing at the moment, right? Uh, and so what I think, you know, a business like, like ours in New Zealand, headquartered business, if we can genuinely make it cheaper and more predictable uh, for exporters around the Pacific uh, to engage in international trade, then I think that can only be a good thing. And so technology genuinely does have that potential. Uh, and when you think about non-tariff barriers, in some ways, and like they're always going to be there because of the domestic constituency that supports them, but in some ways technology can work right around non-tariff barriers and take uh, some of those processes out of the hands of people who otherwise might make things more difficult. So I'd say from a New Zealand perspective, a business like Trade Window and others uh, that, are, uh, that are setting about to take regulations, apply technology to them, uh, lower the barriers to entry uh, across, the, across countries, across Australia, New Zealand, the South Pacific, I think that's certainly one, one opportunity. Thanks, Craig. Um, so, you know, as an airline, naturally, I'd say focusing on connectivity and, you know, not only that, but the, the resilience of connectivity. Um, we saw during COVID again the introduction of the MIAC scheme and how important, how critical um, transport connections were to, to basically keeping um, uh, those, the Pacific running, basically. Um, and so, in that, may, investment in the right infrastructure. Um, you know, I've seen recently some investment from MFAT in uh, Nui and um, upgrading the, the, the airport there, which is fantastic and just helps build that resilience moving forward. Again, probably a broken record, but um, future proofing, so working with the Pacific on sustainable aviation moving forward, so uh, the potential for um, electric or hydrogen powered aircraft to connect islands moving forward to, to, to ensure they're, they're more self-sustainable. Uh, again, you know, uh, sustainable aviation fuel adds to, to fuel security um, because it's able to be produced locally. Um, and, you know, we've had serious problems. Um, last, late last year, Samoa nearly ran out of um, fuel, um, aviation fuel, and we had to start tankering into Samoa. Um, we thought that was, you know, how could that ever happen um, here in New Zealand? Two months later it happened here in New Zealand and we had to start tankering fuel from Australia to New Zealand because we were about to run out. So that resilience and security is absolutely key. Thanks. And of course, we've got to be, you know, we, we really need to be focused on the fact that, um, that the Pacific Island nations need to come with us on this journey and not be left behind. Natasha. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important part. I am not by any means any expert on the Pacific, but I've spent much of my life uh, working on developing countries. And it is critically important to bear in mind that what um, from a New Zealand and donor perspective might look like help um, can look almost inevitably in some cases, uh, because of the disparity in resources and size, can look like intrusion. It's very difficult to go in and offer help uh, while 
actually honouring the autonomy of the the party that you're trying to help, and that that you know the there are many aid relationships that can degenerate into somewhat perverse outcomes uh, just because um, the parties are very different in terms of the resources that they have available to them. And many of our Pacific Island countries are very, very small indeed, but also sovereign nations with aspirations for autonomy and independence. Um, and so, you know, it is, it is quite shocking to me and when, when I made a visit to Vanuatu some years ago to see just how much of the local economy was run by Australians. And I, I can't imagine that that would have been that satisfactory to many people um, to see so much of their economy very obviously in foreign hands. Yeah. And I think um, uh, you know there's a there's a real opportunity here when we talk about Australia and New Zealand and the Pacific. New Zealand has. Um, uh, deeper and stronger relationships, particularly in Polynesia, um, uh, and 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 um, you know I'm very firmly of the view that partnering uh, to create enduring economic activity is um, a much more successful approach in developing Pacific Island economies. And um, when we talk about stability in the region, that strengthens relationships rather than just looking at it purely from an aid or, or contribution viewpoint. Can I open up um, uh, the conversation to the floor um, and invite any questions um, to our panellists? There's one over here. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, thanks for the panel. It's very interesting. Um, I'm Patrick. I'm from the Trade Law Unit in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, my question is about the current legal regime, and I just wondered the panel's thoughts on whether the current legal regime, uh, in your mind, is effective in helping us achieve the uh, goals you've been discussing today. Um, and I know you were talking about the idea of a Trans-Tasman Digital Economy Agreement um, of some sort, but I wondered if there are any other ideas or thoughts you had on that. Sorry, Patrick, I just didn't grab it. Which regime? The Like the current regime, you know, like CER oh, or oh, just, right. yeah, right. agreements okay. general. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, well, certainly um, uh, from an ANZ left perspective, we're keen to enhance the current arrangement, and um, and so so the commentary uh, which Adrian gave that uh, that CER often gets referred to as a gold standard free trade agreement um, uh, certainly might have been a comment that was relevant 40 years ago, um, and it's still a very effective free trade agreement, and it underpins free trade between both countries. But that doesn't mean we can't improve it, uh, and so we, we've talked about the the, um, the digital trade corridor. Um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could and should be trying to enhance that agreement. But but often the, the conversation, and perhaps you'd like to go down this pathway, Adrian, often the conversation is around what are the practical steps here that we need to recommend to both governments to try and agree on? Yeah, so just uh, you know, a couple of thoughts. Uh, CER is a great agreement, no question. Uh, I mean, we can't improve it. Uh, and so we, we've talked about the, um, the digital trade trade corridor. Um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could and should be trying to enhance that agreement. But but often the, the conversation, and perhaps you'd like to go down this pathway, Adrian, often the conversation is to recommend to both governments to try and agree on. Yeah, so just uh, you know, a couple of thoughts. Uh, CER is a great agreement. No question. Uh, I mean, we can't improve it. Uh, and so we, we've talked about the, um, the digital trade corridor. Um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could and should be trying to enhance that agreement. But, but often the, the conversation, and perhaps you'd like to go down this pathway, Adrian, often the conversation is to recommend to both governments to try and agree on. Yeah, so just uh, you know, a couple of thoughts. Uh, CER is a great agreement, no question. Uh, I mean, we can't improve it. Uh, and so we, we've talked about the, um, the digital trade. Um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could... ...trade corridor. Um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could... 
there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could... Trade corridor. Um um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could. Trade corridor. Um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could. Trade corridor. Um um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could. Trade corridor. Um, um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could. Trade corridor. Um, um, there are a number of areas, I think, where we, we could. Trade corridor. Um. 
there are a number of areas I think where we, we could Trade corridor. Um, there are a number of areas I think where we, we could. Trade corridor. Um um, there are a number of areas I think where we, we could. Trade corridor. Um, um, there are a number of areas. There are a number of areas on 